Good morning. My name is Amy Dayrees. I'm publishing a book in a few weeks called Solve Your Sleep for Better Health. I'm a dentist that practices in a suburb of Atlanta, Georgia. And a number of years back, I had some family members that weren't sleeping very good, and it caused me to pause and wonder why and try to look for solutions that might help them sleep and also help myself sleep because I know that good sleep is going to help you age your best and creates resilience within yourself. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to the first of my webinar series that's called Solve Your Sleep for Better Health. That's also the title of my book. Um, also, Get to the Core of Your Snore. And today we want to talk about what good sleep looks like. So this is going to take about 20 minutes, and um, I'm going to share the slide here. One second. And let's see, I'm gonna expand this here. So what does good sleep look like? Most Americans feel that they aren't sleeping well. Um, the average adult probably needs about seven to eight hours of sleep. Children, about eight to 10 and little babies, a lot more than that. Um, a lot of our lifestyle choices in our modern day um, kind of contribute to us not sleeping as well as we could or as long or as deeply as we need to. And um, these results in the health troubles of daytime sleepiness, difficulty focusing, anxiety, depression, hypertension, um, how we process our foods even is, is going to be related to sleep. And then we later have increased mortality because of chronic disease processes. So um, a couple of years ago, I finished a integrative medicine fellowship and I wanted to share with the world what I learned about sleep. Also, dentists are oftentimes the first people that might recognize when a patient isn't sleeping well. Because a lot of our patients, when we're not sleeping well, we begin to grind or clench our teeth, which causes wear and tear on the teeth. It's probably the number one reason I have to replace dental work. In kids that aren't sleeping well, we see other types of trouble, sometimes different from adults, um, high prevalent rates of ADD, ADHD. In a lot of those cases, it's because the child has a compromised airway. They may be bedwetting. Um, they might have crowding of their teeth and narrow arches, maybe bags under their eyes, which can could contribute to anxiety and um, just not draining things well, being sickly, having a lot of allergies. And later on in patients that have upper airway resistance, we might see snoring. And actually 40% of our adult population snores. We might see digestive symptoms, cold hands and feet, teeth grinding mental fog, restless sleep, and anxiety or depression. Today we're gonna to review the differences between snoring, sleep apnea, chronic allergies, and other anatomical causes of difficult nasal breathing, such as a deviated septum. So there are four stages of sleep that we cycle through at night. Oh, here's our, here's our slideshow on our poor sleep symptoms. And then this, these are just sort of the typical faces of sleep apnea. We have um, a child who might have uh, these chronic circles. They may have a thin or a narrow jawline um, towards their chin. And um, a lot of times, like I said, they have focus issues. Here's the typical adults who might have sleep apnea troubles. Their ear is often anterior or in front of a, a direct vertical line over their shoulder. Um, they posture forward in order to open up their airway. A lot of times you'll see an acute angle here or a shorter upper lip, and that's an indicator that they might have trouble sleeping when you're just looking at them extra orally. And a lot of times obesity goes with, with trouble sleeping. Um, here's also some cone beam x-ray images of um, a narrow airway. You might see here we have uh, a very narrow airway and they sort of make it color-coded to make it easy to see. Um, the orange and red here can indicate uh, a narrow airway. And then when it's behind the teeth, this is a place where possibly a dental appliance might be able to enlarge the airway and make it easier for the person to breathe. And so here we are to the stages of sleep. I think we're all caught up between the um, slideshow that I have prepared for this little mini webinar and um, where I wanted to go with our notes. 
So the stage one, you're going to have these EEG features when you have a professional sleep study done. And a lot of people ask, well, I have a Fitbit or I have a phone app. Um, how is a professional sleep study different or a take home at night sleep study different from what my Fitbit can do? And, and here is what we're able to retrieve from these professional based sleep studies. We are measuring these brain waves that, um, and we also measure blood, blood oxygen saturation. We're measuring decibels uh, and how loud and how long and how much you're snoring and what body position you have that coordinates with those, with those different pieces. We also, when we're measuring that oxygen saturation, we're looking at heart rate variability. And um, so can your Fitbit do all that? And I think the answer is right now it doesn't. Um, one of the nice things between a take-home sleep study and sleeping in a clinic would be you might have more control over what night you get tested. You might even test several nights over a period of time. <clears throat> Whereas if you're in a sleep clinic, you're gonna pay a lot more you're going to have people watching you. You're not going to be in your own bed. And um, so I, I like the take home sleep study option. And dentists or doctors can provide this for you. <clears throat> I use the watch pad. We'll get into that in a little bit. So, stage one lasts up to generally 10 minutes. It's when you're in light sleep and our eyes move slowly, our muscle activity is slow, the blood pressure falls a little bit, and your brain temperature decreases. Sometimes in this stage, we experience the feeling of falling and can have sudden but mild movements that move us into the next phase of sleep. And sometimes people with irregular sleep patterns tend to have jerky movements during this time more often. Stage two sleep lasts about 20 minutes after the stage one. And by the way, when we're in sleep, we fluctuate in and out of stages one through four. So stage two, generally in the first cycle, lasts about 20 minutes. Our eye movements stop, the heart rate and brain waves slow with occasional more rapid bursts. We start getting these so-called K complexes with our brain waves. And it can become a little harder to wake up somebody who's in stage two. We spend about half, 45% of our night's sleep in stage two as we cycle in and out between two and four generally. Stage three is also called deep sleep. We start having a slowing uh, slow wave brain waves or delta sleep wave pattern that can and it can become more difficult to wake up somebody in this stage again um, this is when you might be unresponsive to external noises that might be going on around you and it's in this phase of the sleep that kids or even adults might be more likely to like wet the bed um, or have nightmares talk in their sleep even uh, walk in their sleep and snoring with patients who have sleep apnea is actually less common in this stage three sleep. Um, and then, <clears throat> and we get into stage three about 30 to 45 minutes after we've fallen asleep. <clears throat> and then stage four and, and is somewhat interchangeable with what we call REM sleep. It's also called paradoxal sleep. And our first stage REM sleep lasts about 10 minutes, starts about an hour after we initially go to sleep. We have a second and a third phase that lasts progressively longer, and uh, maybe the second, third of the night, and then the last REM sleep generally would occur about an hour before we wake up. And ideally, we would get about 20 to 30% of our sleep in REM. That's something else a professional sleep study will measure is how much REM sleep you're getting. Um, the REM sleep is when your body is able to heal, your brain is able to dream. Um, so a sign of not getting REM sleep is when you're not having dreams. In infants, um, they have a slightly different sleep pattern, but they are trying to establish a, a regular adult sort of sleep pattern, um, which of course takes a while to evolve. But in stage one, they're, they get sort of droopy eyes. They, their eyes might close and open. They might seem to be dozing, even sitting up a little bit. In stage two, again, they're in light sleep and the baby might move and jump or um, at loud noises. Deep sleep, the baby's quiet and doesn't move. And in stage four, they're in very deep sleep and they don't move, but they're getting that REM sleep where you see their eyelids move a little bit. And um, <laughs> snoring versus sleep apnea. Um, the prevalence of actual sleep apnea in the general population is about 4%, about 40% of us are snoring on a regular basis. 
And if you're snoring or if your spouse, a loved one is snoring, you really wanna to get to the bottom, the core of their snore, if you will, why they're snoring, because you want to eliminate if they have sleep apnea. Other people that are snoring might have an upper airway resistance, which means the upper part of their airway, their breathing tube is constricted. And you want to look into why that is. A Kunbi X-ray can help identify the why that they might be having this restriction maybe a deviated septum, which can be witnessed from that cone beam x-ray that we reviewed a few minutes ago, or it may be that they have a constricted area, airway that's behind where the teeth are. The reason that you could have kids that have ADD or ADHD issues when they um, have a constricted airway located behind the teeth is it compresses all the space, everything, all these vital parts that are from the brain stem to where the teeth are. Um, those areas include your esophagus, your breathing tube, the vagus nerves, the carotid arteries, all these very vital tissues that affect a whole lot of our vital functions. The tongue is the second muscle to develop after the heart, and it's innervated by the vagus nerve, as is the heart. When the tongue is in a more forward down position, it contributes to the patient never really developing the heart rate variability that they could otherwise have. On that same token, if you have somebody who is tongue tied, they're not able to develop a heart rate variability. So in terms uh, of diagnosing sleep, you have some typical vocabulary words that the sleep professionals um, talk about. So hypopnea, uh, well, let's actually do AHI first since that's our first one listed. When you have a score of over five in adults, but over a one in a child from a sleep test, you're gonna be considered probably to have at least a mild sleep apnea issue. When that AHI score is over a 15, you're going to be moving into the moderate to severe range of sleep apnea diagnoses, generally speaking. And when you're over a 25 AHI, that's when you're gonna have generally a severe diagnosis. So AHI, AHI is the hourly average number of times the person can't breathe or when their oxygen level is dropping. This number is what determines the, the person's severity of sleep apnea. And a physician is going to ultimately make that diagnosis, although tests can be given, for example, by dental offices. But we would still run it by our colleagues, the physicians, to give the final diagnosis. And reading sleep test is sort of a specialty. I want to make that clear as well. Um, so your average pediatrician or um, average internist generally is not wanting to be the one to do the diagnosis. RDI is um, the next vocabulary word that a lot of us sleep people are talking about. And it's the number, the score of your combined number of apnea, hypopnea, which means lower oxygen, and rear is, which is when you're having trouble breathing per hour of sleep. Hypopnea is when your oxygen levels is, is dropping, and you generally wanna keep that at the oxygen level, blood, blood oxygen saturation level over a 90. Um, this is a picture down here of the watch pat sleep um, test, and this little finger cuff is what helps to read the oxygen saturation level in your fingertips. Sometimes this can also be worn on your foot uh, connected to a toe. And UARS is the acronym for upper airway resistance syndrome when you have a, an airway constriction um, in the upper part of the airway. So this is what, um, for instance, a watch pat sleep test result is going to look like. You have on here your percentage of REM time. Remember, I mentioned we want to get between 20 and 30%. This person's about 19.2% of the time. They didn't sleep very long. This shows they only slept. They were only reported as sleeping not quite four hours, so a very short time period for sleep. The blue down here is um, how when they were having actually trouble breathing, uh, an upper airway resistance sort of pattern. The orange is the level of snoring that they had and recorded in decibels. This does not really, um, if you were talking in your sleep, it, it, I guess it would be um, recorded as some sort of a sound, but generally this is not recording anything other than the level of sound you're making. It won't record, for instance, words if you were talking or something in your sleep. And the black line here that's uh, overlying the orange 
is the body position that you're sleeping in while you're sleeping. So this particular person was on their left side and then they turned over to their right periodically through the night. The black further below is the oxygen saturation level. And the orange is the, or excuse me, the red down here is the um, heart rate, the pulse rate here. And then these red lines that are a little harder to see are when that person is in REM sleep and also the different other sleep cycles with those spindles, the case spindles, and the, the brain waves being recorded. I'm showing you the final page of the sleep test. It is recording all of those detailed brain waves throughout the, throughout the evening. So this person overall had an RDI. Remember, that's the number of combined apnea, hypopnea, and rearers per hour. They were getting 21 all night, total events of 86. The AHI, which is the average number of times the person can't breathe, or when the oxygen level drops. Um, all night long, they had 13 of these, and their oxygen saturation does fall below an 89. And while I didn't diagnose this, this person was diagnosed to have a mild sleep apnea issue. And um, as I said, dentists are oftentimes one of the first people to diagnose sleep. And we often will see things like this. We'll see um, very worn down teeth. We may see fractures in the teeth. Um, a lot of times a history of crown work. These are crowns up here. Um, sometimes a shifting where the teeth are no longer even, particularly in the front. So as a patient, you might also diagnose a little bit or pick up on some of these symptoms yourself. You may wake up with sore jaws. Um, where it feels like you've been chewing a lot. You may notice some popping or clicking in your jaw that's new or muscle soreness, even like a sprain. Um, you might notice that there's a scalloping. This is actually pretty mild in this photograph of the tongue. And that's caused from the tongue pressing up against the back of the teeth. It could be a tongue thrust or a forward downward position, which we mentioned um, is really a way that the body is stimulating the tongue with the vagus nerve, which is going to ramp up your sympathetic nervous system. And when we're more rested, our parasympathetic nervous system is kicked on more. Um, so we want to downregulate that fight or flight, that sympathetic, and turn on our parasympathetic system. There's other chemicals that um, the body uses to influence our sleep. We have serotonin, dopamine, and melatonin. And um, Let's go over what those are for. Dopamine production issues play a role in a patient who has Parkinson's, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. Generally speaking, dopamine acts as sort of a chemical reward system. So when you do something great, you get sort of a surge of dopamine. Um, you do something that makes you feel happy, that's that surge of dopamine that you're feeling. Um, but for people that don't make enough dopamine, they can feel low, low, low motivation um, or they can feel like they've been victimized or experience a loss of interest in activities that they used to enjoy. These people oftentimes battle depression. Uh, when your body fails to make enough dopamine, the reason can be that you're experiencing stress, pain, or a traumatic event. But dopamine is also associated with addiction. People can get sort of used to that having that high. And so people that have issues like gambling might um, need to um, get a repeated or a higher and higher surge of dopamine to kind of feel that sense of happiness that they initially had. So um, dopamine is also known to play a role in digestion with relation to how your body processes insulin. And it's also linked to how your body moves food through the GI tract. And it's a chemical that increases the mucosal lining of the intestines. So dopamine has a very important role. I guess I went out of order, but we'll do serotonin next. Serotonin is the other neurotransmitter that helps you regulate a metabolic pathway associated with mood. Its effect is to help you regulate your mood. Serotonin reuptake inhibitor pharmaceuticals like Prozac, for example, an antidepressant, allow your body to use serotonin more conservatively, which means you're gonna get more bang for your serotonin buck, so to speak. Medical doctors often use these pharmaceuticals to help patients fight depression. So when you aren't getting enough serotonin, um, it's going to play a role in those people um, that tend to suffer from anxiety, um, sometimes autism, bipolar disorder, 
and OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, and also like a, having a social anxiety. 95% of your body's serotonin is found in your GI tract. When you eat something toxic, serotonin is the neurotransmitter release to help you vomit or expel that food more quickly by stimulating gut contractions. And low serotonin in the gut is linked to constipation. So there's no clear way to absolutely measure your serotonin or dopamine levels that are in your body. But the, generally what, is, what happens is if you go to your doctor with um, symptoms of depression or anxiety, um, the doctors often will prescribe um, pharmaceuticals for treating the symptoms related to depression or sleep. And then melatonin is a chemical that your body is going to make. It helps you set the, the circadian rhythm of your body. Circadian rhythm is um, sort of the schedule that your body wants to be on. We all have a natural circadian rhythm ske schedule. And generally for humans, that's where we are awake during sunlight hours and we go to sleep during the evening hours. And melatonin helps us to regulate that. So traditionally, maybe consider how we might have worked out in the fields. And we, our skin uh, would be exposed to the sun, which helps our bodies make our own, our own melatonin. Melatonin also helps us to absorb vitamin D, which you also get from the sun. So um, the melatonin, when we, when we have enough of it, it does seem to help us to go to sleep when it's time to go to sleep at night. So I wanted to give you a couple of suggestions. This is our first of the webinar series on Solve Your Sleep for Better Health. And I wanted to give you some suggestions that maybe you could start sleeping better tonight with a couple of these things. <clears throat> so for not a lot of money, <clears throat> you can either order on the internet or even maybe try something that you might already have sitting around your house. And that would be bandage tape or you know, tape for, um, for gauze if you had a bad cut, or you can actually buy specifically mouth tape. Um, the adhesive type of tape for a bandage is, is slightly more uh, resistant to water, <clears throat> but you can try maybe before you go to bed, maybe you're watching a TV show or catching a movie or you're doing something where you're not actively trying to speak to people and you tape your mouth shut, which is going to encourage nasal breathing. When your tongue is down and not in the roof of your mouth, your mouth is going to have more of a tendency to be just open. Um, and then that's going to stimulate that sympathetic nervous system, which you want to take down, tap down. And it's also going to encourage you to um, breathe with your mouth open. When we breathe with our mouth open, we're not as able to, um, we, we inhale and exhale generally too much volume of air. Uh, Dr. Bataiko was a Ukrainian physician, and he discovered back in about 80 or 90 years ago, and did research that was published on this topic, that it was very helpful to hold on to at least 6% of carbon dioxide in your body. When we are inhaling and exhaling through our mouth, we generally over inhale, over exhale. Um, people with asthma have found that it's helpful to swim when they're engaged. Uh, it, it seems to help um, prevent the asthma attacks being as, as difficult as, as often as severe as they might have been and because they've taught themselves through the swimming to regulate their breathing a little bit more rhythmically and um, consider you know if you're doing for instance freestyle and you you turn your arm to breathe outside um, underneath your shoulder there you only have a split second to catch that breath before your face is resubmerged into the water to continue going propelling yourself forward um, so if you can train yourself to breathe through your nose during waking hours, then you might be able or build, being able to build up to breathing through your nose when you sleep. And some people find that taping their mouth shut is an effective helper way to learn to breathe through their nose more effectively. Snore strips can also be helpful. Um, actually, when I make some of the dental um, sleep appliances that I do, one of the tests that I do is I want to know if you can breathe more easily if you spread your, your nostrils apart slightly. And that's what snore strips can do. Something like snore strips is they help pull your nostrils apart to potentially open the airway more. That can be an upper airway resistance um, helper. So um, like I said, we have some upcoming topics on, in this webinar series. And 
um, next week we're going to be doing a series on how to use herbs for sleep. And then we'll do a second part of that, which is how to use herbs for feeling more awake and, and how to select these, maybe the, maybe one or two of them that would, that would be best suited for you and in a form that you find easy to use. And then we'll do further uh, webinars on controlling your inflammation and exercise to help you sleep better. Uh, which vitamins and minerals, when those are depleted, can affect your sleep and what to do about that, how to dose for those to, to improve your sleep. What hormones and genes can affect your sleep and how to apply knowledge about that and, and change how you sleep from that. What types of lifestyle choices can you change to be able to sleep better? And then what are the surgical and non-surgical options available to remodel your airway so that you can sleep better. If you're drinking through a coffee straw, you, you are not gonna breathe as easily or as well or as efficiently as if you're breathing through a garden hose. So we want to look at how can we increase your breathing airway. And then last but not least, um, a lot of people out there over the years have suffered concussions it could have even stemmed from a trauma at birth, a long delivery, a difficult delivery process. And you may have had a constriction in your airway from the get-go or some sort of a head trauma. Or you may have played football somewhere along the way. There could be many reasons um, you might have sustained a concussion, a mild concussion, but that can also affect your sleep. So we'll talk in another webinar about what you can do to unwind or fully heal more fully from that concussion. So this is just a little teaser. Um, we're gonna be talking about our next week's webinar. It is on melatonin and 5-HTP, which are over-the-counter supplements that you can take. Um, melatonin and serotonin um, are in 5-HTP. They're all from the same pathway. We can also stimulate this pathway when we eat our Thanksgiving turkey, which um, helps us to create this 5-hydroxytryptophan, also known as HTP which creates serotonin, which is broken down into N-acetylserotonin, which is broken down into melatonin. So when we go to sleep at night, remember how I mentioned if you're working in the fields that you would have been exposed to sun, your skin would therefore make melatonin, which helps you to go to sleep. A few hours later, it sets your circadian rhythm. You can take and induce this same pathway with an over-the-counter supplement. And we'll talk about the appropriate dosages of this and when do you take it in next week's webinar. Same thing for 5-HTP and who should be doing this or who might try this. So we're gonna try to do these upcoming seminars on Tuesday evenings at 7.30 Eastern Standard Time. And I hope that you'll consider joining us. These are gonna be later offered as a recorded version, but if you'd like to do a little Q&A at the end of each webinar, consider coming on at 7.30 right here on Zoom. Thank you so much for listening. Our book, it's called Solve Your Sleep for Better Health, Get to the Core of Your Snore, will be released on Amazon, Kindle version on June the 6th, 2019. And our paperback, hardback version is going to be out more towards September and the holidays it'll be, hopefully in bookstores. So um, if you're interested in joining our mailing list, please send your email address to amy at wholehealingdental.com for next week's webinar on sleep. You can also visit http slash slash www.wholehealingdental.com where you can read our blog. You can catch some of my uh, recent radio podcasts through United Intentions Network that are some about sleep and really all types of things related to dentistry and teeth and healing the whole body. Thank you so much. We're gonna stop this slide share now. And um, I just want to say I look forward to meeting with you all, and um, hopefully I can help you to sleep better starting tonight. Have a great day.